Um, today, I, I have a very important topic to talk about. That is uh, Jesus' administration in the most holy place. This topic is so important that Satan tries to get the people of God to not even think about it. In fact, if we're able to go widescreen on that, I mean, full screen. In fact, Ellen um, G. White says in Great Controversy, Satan invents unnumbered schemes to occupy our minds that they may not dwell upon the very work with which we ought to be acquainted as the work in the, place, in the heavenly sanctuary. The arch deceiver hates the great truth that brings to view an atoning sacrifice and an all-powerful mediator. He knows that with him, everything depends on his diverting the minds from Jesus and his truth. So what does Satan do? Satan tries to divert our mind, our minds from focusing on what Jesus is doing for us in the most holy place. So today I ask that as I go over the lesson that you just pray that you focus, pray for me that uh, everything I say will not be my own words, but things that are from God. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, blessed be the name of our God. We thank you for the Sabbath day. We thank you for this moment where we get to see a glimpse of what your son, Jesus Christ, is doing for us in the sanctuary. We ask now that you will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I pray that your Holy Spirit will guide my mouth to say what is of your word and not my own words. And I also pray that your heavenly angel will be in the midst, holding back evil angels from distracting us. We just pray that lives will uh, be changed as we contemplate your son's work in the heavenly sanctuary. I pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. In the seventh month and on the tenth day of the Hebrew calendar, once a year, a high priest would take a young bullock as a young male cow for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. After washing himself, he would put on holy garments and a meter upon his head. He would then take two young goats from the children of Israel as a sin offering for the children of Israel and one ram for a burnt offering for the children of Israel. The bullock, that is the young male cow, was designated as a sin offering for the high priest and his household, making atonement for himself and for his household. Next, the high priest would take the two goats and present them to the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Then he would cast lots upon the two goats. One lot was for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. I knew, I knew if I would get it. And the goat that the Lord's lot fell upon was designated as a sin offering, but the goat that the other lot fell upon was to be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and was to be released into the wilderness as a scapegoat. The high priest would take the bullock that is the sin offering for himself and would make an atonement for himself and his household. Then he would kill the bullock for himself. After, he would take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off of the altar that is before the Lord. And with hands full of sweet incense beaten small, he would bring the incense and censer within the veil and would put the incense onto the fire before the Lord so that the cloud of incense could cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony or commandment so that he, the high priest, would not die. Next, he would take the blood of the bullock and using his finger, he would sprinkle the blood upon the mercy seat eastward and before the mercy seat seven times. Afterward, 
he would kill the goat of the sin offering, bring the blood also within the veil, and would sprinkle the goat's blood in the same fashion that he did with the bullock's blood. And because of the uncleanness and transgressions of all the children of Israel's sins, the high priest had to make an atonement for the holy place and for the tabernacle of the congregation. During this time, no person was allowed in the tabernacle of the congregation until the high priest completed making an atonement in the holy place for himself and for the congregation of Israel. I hope I didn't lose your attention because then the high priest would go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it and was commanded to take the blood of the bullock and of the goat and pour it upon the horns of the altar all around it. And he would use his finger to sprinkle the blood upon the altar seven times to cleanse and hollow the altar from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Once the high priest was done making reconciliation for the holy place, tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he would bring the live goat and he would lay both his hands upon the head of the goat and he would confess over that goat all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat. And by the hand of a fit man, the goat bearing all their iniquities was to be led away into an uninhabited part of the wilderness and then released. That day was known as the day of atonement. My blood, my blood. Today we'll be focusing on the ministration of Jesus Christ in the most holy place in reference to Leviticus chapter 16. So the Day of Atonement. We first have to look at the Day of Atonement. We have just been taken through part of the process in the Day of Atonement as described in Leviticus 16. The sanctuary had the outer court, which is not shown in this picture, which consisted of the brazen altar of burnt offering and a labor for the priest to wash in, wash in which is actually shown right there. The inner court had the holy place, which consisted of the golden lampstand, or the menorah, with seven golden candlesticks, branches, a table of showbread, and the altar of incense before the veil of the most holy. And we had the most holy place also, also in the inner court that consisted of the Ark of the Covenant, which housed Aaron's rod, a golden pot of manna, and the Ten Commandments. And the lid of the Ark was known as the mercy seat. Right. Patriarchs and Prophets states that above the mercy seat was the Shekinah, the manifestation of the divine presence. It goes on to say regarding the altar of incense that the incense ascending with the prayers of Israel represents the merits and the intercession of Christ, his perfect righteousness, which through faith is imputed to his people and which can alone make the worship of sinful beings acceptable to God. By the way, I have quotes, I mean, the sources if you want. That's Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 30. So first, what does atonement mean? If we look at the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the first definition is reparations for an offense or injury. Second definition, the reconciliation of God and humankind through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. And the third rep definition is simply the word reconciliation. The definition is also hinted at Leviticus 16.20 when it said, end of reconciling the holy place. So, we know that it means reconciliation. But what caused this need to be reconciled? If you go to Leviticus 13.30, it says, For on that day shall the priest make an atonement or reconciliation for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. So what is it about our sins that calls for reconciliation with God? Isaiah Chapter 59, 1 through 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that 
he will not heal. You see, church family, the reconciliation is not because God departed from us, no, but because we departed from God by following after our course of sin. Ever since the fall of man in Genesis 3, man has been attempting to separate or hide from God because of his sin. In Genesis 3.21, we see a type of atonement or reconciliation being made when God had to kill animals and use that skin to clothe Adam and Eve from their nakedness and shame that came from sinning. Throughout the centuries, the children of Israel were instructed to make daily sacrifices for their sins. This was known as the daily ministration because every day they needed forgiveness and reconciliation. However, the Day of Atonement was a holy day set apart from any other day where they were not even supposed to work on that day, but rather afflict their souls. So the daily ministration showed, and I quote, a daily consecration of the nation of Israel to Jehovah and their constant dependence upon the atoning blood of Christ. That's the daily. The daily ministration was performed at the altar of burnt offering in the court of the tabernacle and in the holy place. So in the daily ministration, the sins of Israel were transferred from, from uh, the people to the sanctuary so that the people stood without sin. So remember, they would kill the lamb and they would place their sins upon the lamb. The lamb was killed. That blood was taken into only the holy place in the day did not go into the most holy however in the day of atonement the day of atonement was the only time when the high priest entered the most holy place to, to my understanding as i was doing a lot of the, the studying the day of atonement was a day when god's people also showed a con consecration to jehovah and a constant dependence upon the atoning blood of christ to be cleansed from their sins and in addition, God's sanctuary was cleansed from holding those sins on record so that God could have a clean people and a clean sanctuary. Adding to that, the Day of Atonement was to be treated as a Sabbath day. So let's go to Leviticus chapter 23, starting at verse 26. And when you have it, say amen. Leviticus chapter 23, starting at verse 26. And we're going to look at how the atonement, the day of atonement, was also a Sabbath day. Not the Sabbath day of the fourth commandment, but a Sabbath day. And remember, there were many Sabbath days, some yearly. And I read, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of the seventh month there shall be a day of atonement, it shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And you shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that does any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. Verse 32, verse 32, it shall be unto you a what? Sabbath. Sabbath of rest. Now, if you go to Isaiah 58, it tells us to afflict our soul just means fasting. However, in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 355, it states that every man was to afflict his soul while the work of atonement was going forward. All business was laid aside, and the whole congregation of Israel spent the day in solemn humiliation before God, with prayer and fasting and deep searching of heart. So church family, afflicting one's soul was more than just refraining from food. No, it was a time of fixing their relationship with God, really looking at themselves and saying, what did I do to my brother, to my sister that I need to confess? What did I do in my life that hurt God? It was about getting that relationship right. That is afflicting your soul. So what we read in Leviticus 23 is that the day of atonement was a Sabbath unto them. 
The Day of Atonement was a day when God's people were to engage in heart searching, confessing, repenting, and looking forward in faith to the real sacrifice of the Lamb of God to cleanse them from their sins. But it didn't end there. They also looked forward in faith to the closing events of the great controversy between, and I quote, closing events of the great controversy between Christ and Satan, the final purification of the universe from sin and sinners. Peter. Prophets uh, 3358. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you from all your sins. You shall be clean before the Lord. Leviticus 1630. I wonder what our churches, what West Side would look like if every Friday, beginning at sunset, families engaged in heart search, confessing, repenting to each other, things that they've done during the week that might have harmed each other and claiming the merits of Christ over their lives. What would this church be like if every family did that? We now move on to Jesus' administration in the most holy place. What is Jesus doing right now in the most holy place? In order to understand what Jesus, our high priest, is doing within the veil, we need to go back and see the earthly sanctuary as it is a representation of the heavenly. So let's look at Leviticus 16, 12. When you have it, say amen. Leviticus 16, 12. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off of the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat. We're going to go down to verse 14. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Based on what we just read, what did Jesus take into the most holy place? He censored. It's in this picture back here. Oh, my computer's over there. Uh oh. Um, thing seems to be giving me a little problem today. Can we go back uh, to the first slide of the priest in the sanctuary? A censer. Uh, that one right there. So in Judaism, they held a censer. It had you know coals in there. They put incense on it. That's what he took. That's what Jesus took into. The sanctuary. And what is he pleading over the mercy seat? Based on what we just read. His blood. Now I'm not saying he has an actual bowl of his blood. No. Not at all. The sacrifice that he did on the cross. Where he spilled his blood. That sacrifice. He is claiming that blood shed on Calvary. Over the mercy seat. Amen. You got it. All right. Because the earthly sanctuary was like a physical thing. They had to actually kill the animal and get the blood and stuff. And so he's pleading his blood for his people. Let's see if this is still work. Uh, I need to go over to... Okay, there we go. While Jesus is pleading for the subjects of his grace, Satan accuses them before God as transgressors. The great deceiver has sought to lead them into skepticism, to cause them to lose confidence in God, to separate themselves from his love and break his law. So keep in mind, this is why Jesus is in the most holy place. This is the work that he's doing for us. Give me one second here. Now he points to the record, that's Satan, points to the record of their lives, to the defects of character, the unlikeness of Christ, which was dishonored, which has dishonored the Redeemer to all the to all the sins that he has tempted them to commit. And because of these, he claims them as his subjects. Jesus does not excuse them excuse their sins, but shows their penitence and faith, and claiming for them forgiveness, 
He lifts his wounded hands before the Father and the holy angels, saying, I know them by name. I have graven them on the palms of my hands. Jesus is claiming his sacrifice for us so that we can have a chance at eternal life. He's not excusing our sins. He acknowledges that we have sinned. But he is lifting his hands before the Father. What's on his hands? The nail prints. And before the angels, I know them by name. I have graven them on the palms of my hands. Church family, Jesus Christ is pleading his sacrifice. His blood shed on Calvary for you and me. We know from 1 John 3, 4 that sin is the transgression of the law. And we know that from Romans 6, 23 that the wages of sin is death. Where our blood is due because of our sins. Jesus stands in, 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 in for us and pleads his blood over the mercy seat that houses the law. Jesus is not looking to catch you in sin so he can accuse you and make you feel unworthy. No, Satan does that. Jesus is doing everything he can to save you. Jesus wants to give you the gift of eternal life. Do you know how important it is for us to know where Jesus Christ is and where and what he is doing? Let's go to uh, Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Starting at verse 24. Matthew 24, starting at verse 24. When you have it, say amen. Uh oh. Talking about te technology. Oops. There we go. There we go. All right. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. We're going to stop there. Verse 24 said, If it were possible. Do you know one of the critical reasons why it will not be possible for God's elect to fall into believing false Christs? Or even believing that Satan, when he attempts to look like Christ, is the actual Christ? Evangelism, page 221. The correct understanding of the ministration in the, what? Heavenly. Heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of our faith. The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. Amen. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and work of their great high priest. Position is location. Work is is activity so we need to know his location and his work That's right. by the way all these charlatans are people claiming to be Christ wow that's, that's more than one person right you have some of them I'm familiar with only two you have one in Russia on the far right claiming to be Christ you have one in the middle on the top of the glasses Australia and, and 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 if you're into whole, that whole black Hebrew Israelite thing, Satan got one for you too. Hey, you see that? <laughs> Satan is busy. That's why we need to know where Christ actually is. So I'm just gonna try and go to my blood. So we come to church and we say things like that was a great sermon, Pastor. And then we go right back out into our six days of hardly applying deep study to the Word of God. But then we like to say things like, we will know that Satan personating Christ is not the real Christ. Why? Because his feet will touch the ground. But church family, if you are not studying the Word of God to have a clear understanding of Christ's ministration in the heavenly sanctuary, it doesn't matter if Satan's feet touch dirt, touch pavement, touch turf, touch marble flooring, or touch carpet. If you are not studying God's word and connecting with God on a daily basis, 
you will give into Satan's mesmerizing influence right alongside the rest of the world. You can eat a healthy vegetarian diet all you want, which is important for us. But if you are not studying to show yourself approved, you will be a healthy vegetarian, false Christ worshiping, nominal Seventh-day Adventist. Watching the Passion of Christ or the Chosen does not count as reading your Bible. It only prepares your mind for truth mixed with error so that when Satan descends as Christ, your mind full of the Chosen and ignorant to Bible truth will have you choosing a false Christ or shall we say the cosmic Christ as your Lord and Savior. Isn't that scary? What people are going to say. People are going to look at Satan looking like Christ and think that that is actually their Lord and Savior. Satan will even heal the sick as a means to prove he is Christ. If I can get the next slide. Maranatha 209. These works of apparent healing will bring Seventh-day Adventists to the test. Many who have had great light will fail to walk in the light because they have not become one with Christ. So West Side Church, do not feel that you are so smart that you have Satan figured out. It comes down to this. Study God's word and connect with him so that you can stand when the world bows. Or neglect God's word and you will bow before Satan while God's people stand. You might not like what I'm saying. You might not care for the rest of this message, but I'm here to say the truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. We go into the cleansing of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment. Inspiration tells us that once a year on the day of atonement, the priest entered the most holy place for the cleansing of the sanctuary. We can get the next. Slide. Uh, here we go. Christ's ascension into the holy place after resurrection. We kind of a brief history review. You guys already know. Um, so Christ moves into the most holy place, 1844. No, uh, Christ's ascension into the holy place after resurrection. That's Hebrews 9, Hebrews 9, 12 in the KJV. Then he moves into the holy place. In 1844, as Daniel 8:14, and he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So you go 457 BC, decreed to rebuild Jerusalem. And then you add 2,300 years, because a thousand, let me get this right, a thousand years is as a day for God. Second uh, Peter 3, uh, 3 8, I believe. Um, which gives us 1844, that's when Jesus moved into the most holy place, investigative judgment starts. So, inspiration tells us, at the time appointed for the judgment, the close of the 2,300 days in 1844 began the work of the investigation and the blotting out of sins. All who have ever taken upon themselves the name of Christ must pass its searching scrutiny. Both the living and the dead are to be judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. She goes on to say, Sins that have not been repented of and forsaken will not be pardoned and blotted out of the books of record, but will stand a witness against the sinner in the day of God. So, if we look at that last passage, He is blotting out your sin, even now. Even now. If you are truly repentant of it, if you confess and you truly forsake it, God can wipe it away out of the record. While Jesus has been ministering in the sanctuary, the judgment had been going on for the righteous dead and then for the righteous living. So God is... Jesus has started with the dead. He started with Adam. All the cases of the righteous dead, starting with Adam, all the way up 
He's investigating. And he's blotting out the sins of those that were truly repenting. Okay? So, we started with the first generation. And we can assume by now that he is now blotting out the sins of, of the living. Because he started with Adam. Starting in 1844, looking at Adam, looking at all of those that followed after Noah, Moses. So by now he's most likely, as we're going to see, he made his way into the living. And now our, our cases are being investigated. And he is able, and he is blotting out our sins as we continue to allow the Holy Spirit to uh, sanctify us. Now is the time when we are to confess and forsake our sins that we may go beforehand to judgment and be blotted out. That is historical sketches of the foreign mission of the Seventh-day Adventist. So what she's saying here is that now you can have your sin blotted out in the heavenly sanctuary. I thought I'd hear an amen on that. I mean, I want my sin. I've done some stuff. And to have your sin blotted out Never again, the stuff you did 10 years ago or when you were in high school, the foolishness that we did, it can be blotted out. Amen. Amen. I can, oh, there we go. It wants to work, man, it doesn't want to work. There we go. I, even I, am he that blots out your transgression for my own sake and will not remember your sins. Amen. 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 Remember, Investigative judgment starts with the people of God. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? So, I have another question. What happens when we afflict our souls? What happens when we afflict our souls? I saw the incense and the censer smoke. So remember, he brought a censer into the most holy place. I saw the incense and the censer smoke as Jesus offered their confession and prayers to his Father. And as it ascended, a bright light rested upon Jesus and upon the mercy seat. And the earnest praying ones who were troubled because they had discovered themselves to be transgressors of God's law were blessed and their countenance lighted up with hope and joy. There are two elements that stand out in this passage. First, the saints are in confession and earnest prayer. Second, they are troubled because they discover that they are transgressors of God's law. They don't go around saying ignorant things like, well, I'm a good person, so I should go to heaven. With a contrite heart, as they daily come into the presence of Jesus, they discover more and more that they are unworthy and realize that only God can pardon there is a day coming when Jesus Christ will have to step out of the most holy place. And after that day, no more blood will atone for our sins. That is why it is now that we should be like David when he said, And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 139, 24. So this is what it looks like when we afflict our souls. Be careful if you feel like I'm a good person, so I should go to heaven. They did not do that on the Day of Atonement. That's right. So who is the scapegoat? I want to quickly go through uh, who the scapegoat is. Because Sunday churches are saying it's someone totally different. It was seen also that while the sin offering pointed to Christ as a sacrifice and the high priest represented Christ as mediator, the scapegoat typified Satan, the author of sin. So you'd have to go back to Leviticus to see where it says, while the sin offering pointed to Christ as a sacrifice, there were some sin offerings there, one for the priest, and then there was another one, right? Match it up with Leviticus 16. I'm gonna let you do your study, okay? Because Sunday people are, Sunday churches are saying that the scapegoat is Christ, and that is sacrilege, that's blasphemous, right? So you gotta know this for sure. What happens to the sins of the redeemed that have been blotted out? Then I saw Jesus' work in the sanctuary was almost finished. Almost finished. And after his work there is finished, so when he steps out of the most holy place, 
he will come to the door of the tabernacle or the door of the first apartment and confess the sins of Israel upon the head of the goat. So, so are our sins getting put on the scapegoat right now as we speak? No, that's not what it says. It says when he's done in the most holy place, he will step out, go to the door of the tabernacle, and then those sins that you have confessed and repented of and forsaken, that he blotted out, then they get put on the scapegoat. We got to know this. A lot of Adventists get confused here. Right now with investigative judgment, he's blotting out our sins. Later, when he steps out, they're put on the scapegoat. There's no more blotting out. So after Jesus steps out of the most holy place, he will place all the forgiven, blotted out sins of the saints on the scapegoat, Satan, and the cleansing process of the sanctuary will be complete. And his people bearing the seal of God will be forever clean so that our high priest has a clean sanctuary and a clean and a bride in clean garments. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Are you beginning to recognize the seriousness of Christ's ministration in the most holy place and why we don't have time to keep playing church? Letter of the Manuscripts tells us leading up to that day that Jesus steps out of the most holy place. When the angels are about to loose the four winds, Jesus gazes in pity on the remnant and with uplifted hands cries, my blood, my blood, my blood, my blood. He repeats it four times for his people are unsealed. You can say he said it four times for the corners of the earth, north, east, south, west, west. My blood to the north, the east, south, the west. In Review and Herald, inspiration tells us, The majesty of heaven is standing before the Father, pleading, My blood, my blood, spare the sinner a little longer for my sake. What are, and then she follows up with the question, What are you doing for him while he's pleading? So while Adventists, Keep being part of the world. Jesus is saying, my blood, my blood. Spare the sinner a little longer. What are you doing for him while he's pleading? Jesus Christ. The church members are focused on their political party winning office. The church members are focused on showing off their new cars and clothes. The church members are focused on how much someone makes per year compared to themselves. Church members don't want to confess their faults one to another, but would rather talk about another fault among each other. Jesus Christ, I know that one day you must step out of the most holy place, but we are not ready yet. Please make us uncomfortable in this world so that we can get ready. The atmosphere is not right. The atmosphere is not right in our lives, in our homes, on our smartphones, in our televisions in our marriages, the atmosphere is not right in our speech, in how we treat other races and ethnicities, in our lack of studying your word. The atmosphere is not right because we love the world even though we know that to be friends with the world puts us at enmity with you. Jesus, your blood, your blood, let it not be sprinkled in vain. Save us from ourselves. Help us to desire to do your will do whatever it takes to save us, even if it is through the way of chastisement. In early writings 279, it describes the day when Jesus steps out of the most holy place. She said, I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven. An angel with a rider's inkhorn by his side returned from earth and reported to Jesus that his work was done and the saints were numbered and sealed. Then I saw Jesus who had been ministering before the ark containing the Ten Commandments Throw down the censer. He raised his hand and with a loud voice said, It is done. Amen. And all the angelic hosts laid off their crowns as Jesus made the solemn declaration, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. 
and he that is holy, let him be holy still. Church family, when Jesus steps out of the most holy place, the blotted out sins of the saints will be placed on the scapegoat, and God's people will eternally be identified as righteous and holy. I truly hope you are beginning to see how serious Christ's ministration is in the most holy place for you and for me. This is why we don't have time to keep, uh, this is why we don't have uh, time to keep playing church. We have grace, we are given grace and mercy not to abuse, but they are to help us on our way to heaven as we get Sanctified as we go through sanctification. And as we go through sanctification, we will eventually receive the seal of God. Amen. And that seal is for those who daily desire to have his character and daily desire to live for him. Amen. Our high priest, Jesus Christ, has not stepped out of the most holy place because we are not ready. We have been playing church for so long. Our self-righteousness has blinded us from seeing our true state. We have not truly afflicted our souls to see what needs to be confessed and forsaken. Alan G. Wright wrote, The atonement of Christ, and I heard someone say it one time here, The atonement of Christ is not a mere skillful way to have our sins pardoned. It is a divine remedy for the cure of transgression and the restoration of spiritual health. So it is a divine remedy for the cure of transgression and the restoration of spiritual health. It is the heaven-ordained means by which the righteousness of Christ may not only be upon us, but in our hearts and characters. I'm coming to a close. In the book Life Sketches of Ellen G. White, chapter 30, she had a vision of the narrow way. And on that narrow way, many things had to get left behind as the way grew narrower. The only thing that kept them from falling was a cord representing their connection to God. And as she and those around her held fast to the cords above their heads, they were able to get through tough times where many would have fallen off of the narrow way. Some of you have heard this message today and realized that Jesus has been pleading his blood over you and you have taken his grace and mercy in vain. You realize that time is soon to end and you need to let go of some stuff in your life if you're continue, if you're going to continue walking down the narrow way. Early writing tells us when Jesus steps out of the most holy place, those who are lost will hear, and I quote, with terrible distinctness, too late too late. Those who had prized God's word were hurrying to and fro, wandering from sea to sea and from north to east to seek the word of the Lord. Said the angel, they shall not find it. Someone here today, the atmosphere has not been correct in your life. You have not made your heart a most holy place for the spirit of God to dwell. Let us not say like Jeremiah 820, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Jesus is doing all he can to save you and me. Jesus, please help us to get ready. We are not ready. The atmosphere is all wrong. We love the world too much. We might not have quenched the Holy Spirit, but we toy with him far too often. Jesus is soon to step out of the sanctuary and we need to get our sins blotted from off of the record before he steps out. Jesus wants you to repent and forsake your sin. And if that is what you want, by the power of God, he will help you forsake that sin. Amen. If that is your desire, please come to the front and we will have prayer. Jesus Christ, forgive us for taking your sacrifice in vain and crucifying you afresh. The atmosphere of our hearts needs cleansing. Someone here today is in bondage and desires freedom. Your blood, your blood, we claim your blood over their life. If you are in bondage of any kind, sexual, drug related, filthy language, filthy internet browsing, a filthy mind, 
a social media addiction over reading the word, a love of the world and the things of the world, whatever it may be, if you want freedom from those things, please come up to the front and we're going to have a prayer. If you want to just give your life to God and say, God, I've been part of this world. I know I go from week to week forgetting about you and, and I get so caught up in the things of this world I forget to carry my cross and I know that one day you're stepping out of the most holy place and I feel like I'm not ready please get me ready if that is your prayer come up to the front and if you don't know who Jesus is and you would like to know more about him and get baptized uh, an elder can take down your information please come up to the front and raise your hand I'm so glad that the story doesn't end with him just stepping out of the most holy place. Early writings goes on to say, Then I saw Jesus lay off his priestly attire and clothe himself with the most kingly robes. Upon his head were many crowns, a crown within a crown. Surrounded by angelic hosts, he left heaven. That's early writings. Revelation 19.16 gives us a glimpse of what his robes look like. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Church family, Jesus Christ, our high priest, is coming back as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So I want to praise God. I just thank you for this opportunity to speak on this topic. And I want us to, I, really, I usually don't do this, but... I want us to actually get together. If you could just find someone and we're gonna pray, just get a partner. And we're gonna pray. And then when you gotta finish, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end with my prayer uh, to pray over those that came up. But Jesus is coming very soon. But before he comes, as we saw, he's gonna step out of the most holy place. And many Adventists will be lost. That is a very scary reality. And if we are not connecting with him, it could be one of us. And I pray that no one in this room will be lost. We have many things that are coming to trick us up. The enemy is coming as Christ. He's having charlatans look like Christ to lead people away. We have those petted sins that someone mentioned earlier that we still cherish. And if we hold on to them, just one sin, God can't block will we'll keep us out of heaven. God cannot blot it out if it is uh, not forsaken. So, I want us to just, please, if we can just get into small groups. It is this, the desire of my heart that uh, all of us will, will seek God right now. And then, uh, and then I'll lead off in prayer.
I thank you for what your heavenly angels are doing here today, holding back the evil ones. Our Heavenly Father, we just want to give you all the praise and the glory for the power that was manifested here today. I know that it was not by our mind, but it was by your mind that we were able to see your Holy Spirit working in our hearts, changing us. The fight is not over. We know that every day we must die daily. There are things that we have in our heart that is still not right. There are things that we need to give up to you. I pray that each of us here will get to that place as your Holy Spirit does his perfect work in us, that we will give it to you. We know that one day, Jesus, you must step out of the most holy place. I pray that we will be ready. We ask that you will do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And what we can do for ourselves, I pray that we will not be loved, but that we will give it to you. Save us. The times around us are showing us that you are soon to come. The evil is increasing. The natural disasters are happening on a weekly basis. We see Sunday law on the horizon, and yet your people are still loving the world. We struggle with, with sin on a daily basis. I'm not gonna be up here and act like I don't struggle with it. I know the things in my, you know the things in our hearts. And we know that they have to be blotted out. This is a serious message that the devil tries to get our minds away from because he knows that if he can just distract Adventists long enough, soon when Jesus steps out, it'll be too late. So I pray that we will awake out of slumber, quicken us. May we see that soon it'll be too late and we must do everything right now to crucify the flesh So that we can be cleansed. I just pray that your Holy Spirit will go with us as we leave. And to those that are going to be working in the, in the neighborhoods. That they too will share the good news. We just thank you. And we pray all these things. I pray for those that came up. You know what's on their heart. Specifically. I pray that they too will overcome by the blood of the Lamb. I just thank you for Westside Church, that they are upholding the present truth. May they continue in strength. This I pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. And there shall be no more curse. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face. And his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God, for the Lord God gives them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. Thank you.